Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Ryan Wilbur, and I work for La Marzocco North America. Yes, you do. Um, my name is Scott Callender, and I'm the director of La Marzocco Home in La Marzocco USA. And I'm super happy to be here. Thank you. We are very excited to introduce Mr. Matt Perger. Uh, uh, Ryan, we just talked about this backstage. What do you mean? It's super awkward. I thought we were on the same idea here. His name's not Perger, it's Perger like burger. Sounds like burger, remember? Whatever, dude. No. Whatever. I, you're introducing the speaker and you don't even know his name. I, I know plenty about him. Matt Perger Ugh. was the 2012 World Brewers Cup champion. Um, I'm sorry, Ryan, you are mistaken. It is Matt Perger, and I know this because I stayed up super late watching the internet while Matt performed and got second place in the World Barista Championship in 2013, changed the game for grinding, gave us the coffee shot. I'm pretty sure I know his name, and it's Perger like burger. Matt Perger likes booze like we do, and that's how he became the 2014 <laughs> World Coffee and Good Spirits champion. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I know for a fact, though, it is Perger. It is Perger because Matt is a barista, a roaster, and a partner at St. Ali in Melbourne, Australia. I know a lot about him. Trust me. Perger like Perger. You guys might know Matt Perger as the creator of the uh, Man vs. Volumetrics video, which made uh, quite a sweep around the world and definitely affected the uh, barista culture within the U.S., well, last but not least, Ryan, it is Matt Perger because he started Barista Hustle, a great place to learn everything about espresso and coffee. Perger. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Matt Perger. Perger. Thank you, gentlemen. That's fine. Hi, everyone. <laughs> it's uh, actually Perger, um, just to set the record straight once and for a while. The first time I ever heard Perger was in kindergarten at roll call, uh, and they called out Perger, and I got really, really intensely sad because I'd never heard my name mispronounced before, <laughs> as I was only four, and I cried, and that was day one. <laughs> but uh, it's Perger. So uh, on, the, on the program, it says the death of the barista. Um, I actually wrote the death of the death of the barista, so I'm not going to start raining hate on um, baristas just yet. Uh, still got a few years left before we're all extinct. So. Uh, welcome to Out of the Box, it's really nice to be here. And today I'd like to talk about how uh, baristas aren't going to die, and in fact, they're going to become a lot more important and a lot more specialized, and uh, I think that's a really exciting thing that we need to start talking about. So, I guess uh, what we need to talk about is the elephant in the room of super automatic machines. And whenever I start to talk to baristas about super automatic machines, they get a little bit sad, they kind of don't want to talk about it, then they might start getting a bit angry and giving me arguments about how humans are better than machines, but we're not because machines do the same thing every time and we really suck at that because we're humans. So machines have us kind of cornered and they're coming. Um, for the last four years, what I've been trying to do is make myself redundant. I've been trying to uh, figure out how to make coffee while I'm not on the bar. And the best way to do that is with systems, it's with machines. And uh, fortunately, um, it's not that hard to make really, really good coffee. It's, it's just a recipe. You have a certain amount of coffee in, a certain amount of coffee comes out in the right amount of time with the right pressure at the right temperature. Uh, machines are really good at this amount of coffee goes in, this amount of coffee comes out at this temperature. So what baristas are good at is human interaction. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So for the next 15 minutes, we're going to be talking about uh, specialty coffee. I'm not talking about the average or the, uh, the greater scheme of things. So I guess I need to tell you my definition for specialty coffee because everyone has a slightly different idea of what's going on. For me, at least, specialty coffee is anything that will make the customer spend more money on a cup of coffee. That's not just the quality of the coffee. It can be the experience, the venue, the music playing, uh, the barista, the machine sitting on the bench, absolutely anything, the brand, 
that leads them to the conclusion that they should pay more for that cup of coffee and that experience. So I think that's really important to spread the definition of specialty across the entire experience that the customer has because it's the entire experience. They're not just paying for quality. They're paying for a package deal. So uh, I think a few of us could probably also name a business or two that calls themselves specialty coffee or has a label of specialty coffee, and you might not believe that they are that that specialty coffee badge is warranted by the quality of coffee that they serve. That's because their brand is really good or because the music in their cafes is really good and their customers believe that they should be paying a little bit more for that product. That's proof that it's not just about quality of coffee. So I've made up a little bit of a brand for our discussions today, um, a techno-futuristic uh, brand that might be existing in the future, probably owned by Apple. And it's, uh, it's Intelli Stump Bottle. And we're going to be talking about Intelli Stump Bottle and the challenges that they're going to face and how they're going to have to rearrange things in the future once there's super automatic machines. And um, I think it's actually a really exciting future and something that we should be embracing. So uh, Intelli Stump Bottle has a pretty simple structure, just like most businesses today. What they don't have is 10 roasteries. They have one roastery. They have one or two or three green buyers, maybe a couple of other people in that department. They have a production team. They have a quality control team. All of these teams are really, really structured and intimate, and they make decisions together quickly and efficiently. They have the finance team. They have an HR team. They have all of these things that, are, that an individual business would have, a centralized place to make really, really important decisions. Now, this business, they're buying green coffee and it's really delicious, and they have a brand, and they have a quality of product that their customers are coming to expect. So they need to make sure that at every single step, that message is translated up until the customer. So they've got this really nice team sorting out the coffee quality, they've got a really nice team managing the business, and then comes along 50 cafes, where decisions are being made daily by the hour by people, namely 500 baristas, all of them making random decisions about the quality of coffee. So we have this really, really bad miscommunication towards those 500 baristas who are all making minute decisions that affect the quality of the brand, the quality of the experience, and just how specialty that coffee is. So that's really, really annoying. Uh, training baristas sucks, um, especially with the state that coffee is in. It's very manual. Training people to do manual things doesn't scale to 500 people. It's really easy to teach those people about the brand, about the coffee, so they can communicate that to customers. But training coffee is really, really terrible. And this is how I kind of see trainings at the moment. It kind of goes like this. This is a grinder. It makes coffee really small. We mix it with water. And you have to make sure that the grind is pretty small to stop the pressure from going through the puck too much. But don't make it too fine, otherwise the water's going to block. And on a good day, it's going to be all right. But if the roast is having a bad day, then the coffee's going to be slightly more roasted. It's going to be a little bit more soluble. And that's just, we're going to have to change the pressure. Speaking of pressure, make sure the pressure's at nine bars. We don't know why it's at nine bars, but that's pretty good. And uh, when it drips out, make sure it drips out at seven seconds, but not eight seconds, because that's not so good. And when you wipe the drip tray, make sure that you do it with a clean cloth, not the cloth that was on the milk wand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're going to use a refractometer and plot that on the uh, coffee control chart. And it's going to be really fun. And that's coffee training for me. It just feels like this stupid, wasteful, inefficient mess of a professional coffee company trying to spread their message to a giant team who has to concentrate on so many things and babysit machines at the same time. It's just absolutely ridiculous business prospect. If you wrote it down on paper, not as a coffee person, you would dismiss it straight away. But we have all of these other parts of the business as well that we need to focus on. It's not just about coffee quality. So the answer is super automatic machines. Now, I'm not here today to tell you how to make a machine that makes really, really good coffee completely automatically. That's another talk for another day. And maybe it's another project that I need to come up with uh, someday. But it's super automatic machines. It's not that far off. There are machines that can make pretty damn good coffee automatically. But the one thing that these machines aren't, whatever they will be in the future, I'm predicting, they're not going to be prescient. They're not going to have the ability to taste like humans can. So there's a really, really valuable element in this equation, and that's the barista still. But there doesn't have to be 500 of them. So 
what I'm foreseeing in the future is that these machines will uh, make coffee extremely consistently, but they're going to do that at the behest of a technical barista, say. So a barista will come in, set the machine, make sure everything's perfect for that location with that water at that time for those customers with the current blend, and then the machine will be able to continue producing that coffee consistently. You shouldn't have to do it hour to hour, day by day. It should just be set it up every so often, make sure that it's consistent, and it moves on. So that's, there's still a very, very important human element that's going on with these machines. So uh, there's a few different uh, problems that we're coming to now. And uh, if we have a perfect machine, uh, a really, really, really perfect machine, what you're probably thinking is we're just, we've, we've just turned our specialty cafe into a vending machine. And uh, we'll fire all the baristas, we'll get rid of them, we'll just push buttons and we'll make coffee and we'll get people out the door. That's the complete opposite of what I would love to see in the specialty industry. So I'm going to talk about different bars and also different baristas and how we're going to feed those different people back into the equation. Now, in the pursuit of efficiency and labor costs and making money, which is, yes, we're in business to make money. Maybe we're in business to have a good time or to fulfill other needs, but most businesses need to make money. And that's totally fine. And at the moment, what has happened in this pursuit is bars that are more like kitchen prep areas rather than service areas. There's a group of baristas that are head down, bum up, just churning through coffee endlessly all day long. They don't really interact with customers. They send coffees uh, to a wait staff that will then interact with customers. And this kind of bar just doesn't suit social baristas. It's, it's just really, really intense. Um, some baristas who are maybe um, slightly less social, they, they might really enjoy working on an espresso bar like this, but it's just for efficiency, it, and it's not an enjoyable job. Now, contrary, on the other side of that, we also have bars that are extremely social, and they're usually a little bit smaller. So we have every single customer and every single barista able to communicate with each other at the same time. And that's really great because everyone can be more social, you can communicate the coffee, you can talk with everyone a lot more. Now, in my time in Melbourne, I've noticed that the turnover of staff in venues that are prep kitchens versus venues that are social little hubs is completely opposite. The social cafes have better culture amongst the staff, they have better rapport with customers, they uh, have stronger, loyal customer bases, and the prep kitchen espresso bars, the baristas turn over more frequently, they might be more unhappy, they might be turning to other areas of the business to try and satisfy themselves, like learning about coffee, and it's just not as nice a feeling. So what we really need to do is to figure out how to get this social aspect back into the big bars, because it will help our professionals, and it's also going to help our customers at the same time. Um, if your regulars aren't remembering your birthday, then they're not your regulars. They're just customers who come and get coffee from your cafe every once in a while. Now, Intelli Stump Bottle, to get back to our future, needs to have baristas on their team. Now, there are two kinds of baristas. There's the barista that's very, very technical. You might see them frequenting these bars more often. So if you think of like a really geeky barista that you know, um, they're really, really focused on extraction, on refractometers maybe, or equipment, and they're constantly trying to make the coffee really, really, really good. That is, like it or not, a certain kind of barista that is attracted to this industry. And they're really valuable because they focus on making the coffee extremely good. What they're not necessarily so good at is interacting with customers and performing customer service. Maybe they want to hide behind that machine. Maybe they want to have their head down focusing on coffee all day long. Now, the other kind of barista, I, I would call the first one maybe a, a coffee barista, and the second kind of person would be a people barista, the ones that you would find in this cafe here. And they're not in coffee for the coffee. They're in coffee for the hospitality. And I'm sure all of you know at least one or two baristas that are so damn good at customer service, probably not so good at making coffee, but you would rather go to the bar where the personable, wonderful, human connection of a barista is standing rather than the technical barista who hides behind that counter. 
So we have these two different kinds, very, very polar baristas, and we need to attract them at our futuristic company, and we also need to make sure that they're happy. We need to give them roles that fulfill what they've come to work for. And I think that super automatic machines are going to help us change those two baristas into niche professions rather than just grouping it all into one. So my first sort of new role for the barista, I guess, would be a technical barista. So um, I like to think of this as head barista at scale. So you, uh, Intelli Stump Bottle would hire a couple of technical baristas and they would be invest, the company would invest in them really, really heavily. So they would be learning about all of the coffees. They would be interfacing with the roastery. They would know the roast profiles. They would know the solubility of all, all the coffees. They would know the arrivals. They would know how the blend is constructed, why the blend is constructed. They would know the cost of goods of all of the items on the menu. They would tailor the brew ratios to make sure that all of the drinks retain profitability. They could adjust the menus, adjust the recipes, make sure that everything is absolutely knuckled down. Now, maybe one of these technical baristas could cater to 10, perhaps even 20 or 30 of the venues, roaming around, making sure that those super automatic machines are still calibrated to that coffee, making sure that all the drinks are still being prepared to the correct recipes. And that would be really fulfilling for that kind of barista. If you know a barista that only likes to dial in in the morning and then gets bored for the rest of the day, their job now becomes dialing in. That's all they do. Tweaking things, making sure the numbers are correct, nailing the coffee service from the cafes, finishing that almost final step before the customer and making sure that that really tight, integral unit of communication and structure is carried one step further. Now, uh, I really regret that it's a male for the technical barista photo and a female for what I would call the service barista uh, photo. That's stock photos. I couldn't find good ones with other genders, but that's not intended. Uh, the other sort of style of barista that I would love to see is a service barista. And this would be a barista that doesn't need to focus on making coffee. All they need to focus on is making sure there's a cup on the machine. That's simple. And then they focus 99% of their energy on serving every single customer and making their day, making them remember the entire experience, catering it to customers, talking to them about their day, and emotionally connecting. Now, for me at the moment, when I'm trying to make coffee really, really good, that taxes me. It uses up a lot of my energy when I'm on bar. And customer service, um, unfortunately, sometimes pays a bit of a tax because I'm focusing so much on babysitting this equipment. And when I eventually do step off the machine and have an interaction with a customer, it's almost refreshing that I can talk to them and have a good time. But at the moment, I'm sort of stuck 50-50 between these two things. And other baristas will focus more on service and other baristas will focus more on the coffee. But if I could have a super automatic machine that was nailing the coffee and I didn't have to think about it, my service game would be through the roof. I would remember customers' names so much better. I'd remember that they'd just picked up their dog from the vet, make sure that it's feeling good. I'd remember their birthday. I would make service my profession. Rather than making fiddling with machines my profession, I could focus all of my energies on that. And those baristas who focus on service and the ones who love service, that's what they want to do. And when you hire them, they're probably, they're probably already pretty good at connecting with humans because this is their chosen profession. And if you tell them to spend their energies babysitting a machine, they're not going to be as satisfied. So if you can create a role for a barista that arrived at your place of work because they're a social creature, and they can devote 100% of their energy or 99% of their energy to human connection, there is no way that your customers aren't going to appreciate that extra level of service and attentiveness and just humanity compared to a vending machine. So, I guess the biggest question that you have for me right now is, aren't the customers going to like, realize that we're not using real espresso machines? Um, I'll draw your attention to the fact that every time I go through customs with a tamper, they think that it's a butt plug. Nobody cares about what we're doing behind the bar. They don't know what we're doing behind the bar. It's just some people standing behind a machine making some noises. That's not what the customers are about. There are some customers that want to look behind the bar and see what's going on, but the rest of them want a really, really tasty cup of coffee, they want a connection with a human being early in the morning, and they want to buy that from a brand that they trust and that 
maybe has certain um, socio-economic sort of uh, qualities, or maybe they, they you know, buy fair trade coffee, or maybe they buy organic coffee. There's all kinds of reasons why a customer will buy coffee from a specific company. But what, why they're not buying coffee from a specific company is because you're weighing every handle on a set of scales or using volumetrics or you know, steaming milk clockwise rather than counterclockwise. They just don't care. If you try and tell them the altitude of the coffee, their eyes will glaze over. So why would they care about the technicalities of the machine that's making their coffee as well? It's just a very, very different set of expectations that we need to be ready for from our customers. Uh, pure coffee making is, to be honest, quite boring. Um, it's the same thing over and over and over again. So let's leave that to the machines. We can use our technical minds to focus on making sure the coffee is perfect. We can use our social human minds to make sure that we're engaging with all of our customers. And every single facet of our specialty or high quality coffee businesses will be improved. The prices we can demand will become higher. The profession, uh, the, all the now various professions of baristas will become much more specialized, much more sought after, and much more rewarding for all of our staff. So I feel as though all of these things are a win. And it's not often that we come across a solution to a problem that has a lot of wins. So I really think that we should start embracing it and thinking about it and perhaps making it happen sooner rather than later. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere? Yeah. OK. Nice job. Thanks. So we have some questions for you. And then we'll also want to open it up to all of you. So if you have questions, get ready with those. Hard, uh, hard questions. Controversial. Controversial. The future is super automatics. La Marzocca doesn't make those. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the engineers are running out back right now. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan Wilbur, Captain Obvious. Uh, um, so you had some good questions you're writing down. I think one of the best ones is the last one you showed me. Yeah. So uh, we were sitting there kind of discussing as you were talking. Mm -hmm. And, you know. You weren't listening. Uh, no, not at all. Oh, okay. We were talking about other things. Yeah. No, we were listening. Um, but one of the questions that I had and we were thinking about is if we have these specialized people, somebody that's dialing in the coffee and somebody mm -hmm. that's absolutely focused on that service and that interaction with mm -hmm. people, uh, the question comes up, OK, is this person still trained in the art of coffee at the end of the day? Do they pour the latte art? Who pours the latte art? Oh, yeah, well, you know, the latte art machine is coming. but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess you, you still have to pour latte out you know, it, for the foreseeable future. And mm -hmm. I think that that is one thing that the customers do expect that's visual about the barista craft. So that's one thing that the humans still have, um, that final layer of presentation for the customers. Um, and of course, they would have to be trained in the company, its vision, where the coffee comes from, um, the drinks they're pressing the buttons for. Uh, all, all of those kinds of things, like a, a waiter in the restaurant doesn't cook the food, but they give you really good service and they know how the meal was cooked, they know where the ingredients come from. It's the same idea, we have specialized people in the kitchen cooking the food, we have specialized people out the front serving the customers. I would wonder, what keeps a barista around if they're just service focused in an industry yeah. where... If they're service focused? If they're service focused, yeah. in a, if you're service focused, I think of so many things that you could do mm -hmm. to make more money than to serve coffee yep. uh, or more specialized things. Mm -hmm. Do you think a love for coffee is equally important in that situation or is it... Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, one company that's really good to look at is uh, Starbucks because they have a lot of service oriented staff and a lot of super automatic machines and they have really committed staff uh, and they, you know, they bring them down to their gigantic football stadium training center to pretend to harvest coffee and stuff. And those staff members, they love that experience and they love just coffee. They're not loving the scales and the refractometer and the, and the you know, technicalities, they just love coffee. And it's those service staff that ha already have that love for coffee rather than technical coffee. And if you have a service-focused staff member and you can provide them with an environment that is 99% focused on service, then if that's not rewarding for them, then they're not a service person. They're going to have to figure out what they want. So in this model, I'm kind of just thinking this through, and this is yeah. the first time I'm seeing this too, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, you are no longer separating yourself from Starbucks with the way you're making your coffee. It now has mm -hmm. to be about the coffee itself. Yep. Would that be kind of yeah. how you see that? 
That's like, and your differentiation is this, or at the moment, our differentiation according to our customers is our brand, the, you know, the interactions with the baristas that you have in the store, and the quality of the coffee. The differentiation between specialty and Starbucks right now, according to the customer, isn't what machines we're using, because all they see is a machine. There's no different. If you told people that there was a portafilter behind that machine, they'd be like, what's well, a portafilter? I have no idea. The fact that you've removed that step doesn't change the customer's, like, you know, um, their perspective on how that coffee is made. It's the taste, the marketing that they believe, or the marketing that's being made, and the brand. What's in the middle? So between where we are now and where you're talking about going. Angst. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, I mean, what would you want to see from traditional espresso technology? Like, what could we do to maybe stop the rise of the machines or try to fight against it and still keep quality intact? Like, what, what, what are the steps that could be taken? Well, I think we're, we're probably nearing, uh, I don't want to say that we've finished coffee, but like, we're pretty, we're getting better and we've improved a lot. There's room to go, but it's hot water. Like, it's, you know, it, I like to say that when I'm explaining espresso machines to people, I just say it's a hot, it's a hot water kettle with a pump. And like, we've kind of got that on lock. So really, the things that we need to change are the automation of movement and the automation of um, decision making to make sure that things are more consistent, rather than relying on uh, imperfect you know, uh, hacks, I guess, like using scales and you know, measuring things like that. We just need equipment that does it for us, rather than having to muck around all day and fiddle. Sure. I I could ask you more questions because I have a bunch, yeah, but I, I think we're going to get stuck in our own little world here, so yeah. I want to make sure that we open it up for anyone uh, out in the crowd. If you have any questions, just go ahead and raise your hand. Looks like Tom in the back. I'll come get you. Or go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> make it hard, Tom. <laughs> Mr. Beaumont. Thanks, Matt. Great talk. Um, just, just a couple of things. Could you bring up your slides again for me? Sorry? Could you able to bring up your slides again for me? I your your can't, presentation. I can't hear you at all, really. Yeah. Bring up the slides. Oh, bring up the slides? Yeah. Which one do you want? Uh, the auction rooms. <laughs> auction rooms? <laughs> <laughs> do you like okay. that? Okay. Okay, so just a couple of things that I'm not competitive or anything, but just so we know, linear PB now on the bench. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. This okay. was the negative example. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> uh, so, Matt, my question, I guess, being from Melbourne as well, what I um, have seen trending-wise as well is in relation to the, I guess we'd say the floor staff and the people serving the coffee um, on the other side of the machine. Yep. And uh, maybe five years ago, with little to no knowledge, um, of coffees when they were actually presenting them to the customer and mm -hmm. talking to the customer about that coffee. And now it's very much um, that the barista is also working on the floor and you often go into cafes and see the same people that are on the floor and behind the machine. Mm -hmm. uh, my question to you is, is, is this in some ways a future for service rather than modelling behind the machine the various jobs that the barista may do and dividing it? Is there, is there an opportunity in sort of having a collaboration between floor staff and baristas on a coffee program, dividing it this way? Yeah, well, I guess they become the same person. Um, if, if you have service staff and you, ha and you don't have any more coffee staff, then everyone in your venue is going to be service staff, um, which is kind of what it should be anyway. So I would say, like, maybe there isn't even a bar. Maybe the staff are on the other side of the bar. And I guess the other thing that really changes uh, the the organization of the venue in terms of positions of staff is how many seats you have. Are you a, a table service venue or are you a bar service venue? If you're a bar service venue, then everyone's behind the bar and they will all be sharing roles and trying to have as much service as possible over a bar top. But if you have seats in the cafe, then why do you have a bar if you know, there is no sort of show for people um, or if there isn't really a need for all of that space, you could have it just a station at the side of the room where drinks are, you know, made, and then you bring it out to the customer, and all of that focus is the meter between you and the customer sitting at a table, or the meter between the barista and the customer over a bar, and that's where everything is. So I guess, yeah, positions, 
the positions become all in one the same, um, which is another wonderful thing in terms of business and you know, staffing and hiring is you just have a wonderfully flexible workforce that can do all roles. Next question. Anybody? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt. How do you see the future of specialty coffee in restaurants and cocktail bars? Restaurants? Yep. It'd be great for restaurants because at the moment when we go, we go to a restaurant and we say, We'd, you'd have a really lovely food program and your coffee program sucks and we want you to help you with your coffee program and they say, we can't specialize in that. We're not going to make any money. We're just going to lose money on it. We can't train the staff to do it. They're busy making Negronis or pouring wine and serving our customers. We don't want to have to have a set of scales and an EK43 and an espresso machine and teach people how to use volumetrics. For the restaurateurs, they're going to love it because it's another quality-focused product that they can have in their offering without having to distract their service staff that are already very good at giving customer service. Now they just need to be educated about what the coffee is, where it's from, and what the customer's drinking, like they are with the rest of the menu, rather than this is a grinder, it makes coffee small, don't you know, make it too fine, it'll clog the machine, etc. So for restaurateurs, it's, it's so much better. I mean, they're already using Nespresso machines without us hassling them too much, so this is pretty close. Mr. Mr. Perger. 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 Um, look, I, I've got a question. It's the first time I've heard your speech, and uh, I obviously have a bit of an insight as to what we do back in Melbourne. So I know, for example, with Dan, Dan Hunter at Bray, yep. who's a committed three Michelin star chef who will follow the in recipes and now great mm -hmm. coffee in a what is a phenomenal restaurant and that equipment's back a house so no one sees it yeah so uh, and yet they deliver a phenomenal cup of coffee and make us proud on a day-by-day -day basis my and and uh, the question for me and I guess some of the people in this room particularly from La Mazzocco uh, is there's a certain amount of romance attached to the style design um, theater of coffee making. How do you overcome that in a philosophical sense? Uh, practical or philosophical? Uh, uh, a philosophical, I think. In a practical sense, what you're saying makes sense. We deliver better quality coffee and we can focus on customer communication and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. But there is a love affair and Melbourne's the renaissance city of the world with that love affair. How do you overcome that um, uh, in this room full of characters who have coffee machines tattered on their arms. Yep. Well, I think uh, everyone was really, really excited when they saw the mod bar. And that was, in essence, removing a little bit of that romance that stripped away some of the, the machine and the romance and put it under the bar. So that's kind of like a baby step forwards when you um, show off what the baristas are doing even more. So that's uh, a step to the left and a step to the right at the same time because the customers can see what the baristas are doing um, with a little bit better clarity. But you're also stripping away some of that grandiose machine stuff. So I guess what you need to do is you need to decide whether baristas dancing around behind a bar is part of what the customer wants or what your customer wants, or is, you know, are there other parts of that experience that the customers are looking for? So is it someone doing this and doing this and standing there and doing all this? Is that what the customer's actually you know, wanting when they walk into an espresso bar? Or is it just a machine sitting on the bench full stop I would hazard a guess that 95% of customers that walk into um, cafes wouldn't have a clue. Like if we choreographed a stupid dance that baristas had to do behind a machine that had nothing to do with making coffee, I don't think 95% of the customers would even blink. Just like ha have some other equipment behind there and have them play with it and move it around and then produce a coffee at the end. I don't think the customers would blink once. So we need to figure out yeah, I guess philosophically, um, it's up to the individual uh, owners of cafes how efficient or how far down that road they want to go. And I'm sure there's going to be a couple of equipment manufacturers that will, you know, in the interim, it's kind of like the, uh, the hybrid vehicle. Nobody went straight to battery-powered cars. They kind of went, okay, maybe we'll do a battery, battery with a combustion engine, and then Tesla went all in with the electric car, and now other people are going, oh, wait, electric car's actually pretty good, so we'll go the whole way. It's that same romanticism um, with you know, even driverless cars, um, 
how pragmatic and how efficient and how useful a super automatic machine is will probably overtake all the other considerations. And if you want to apply a little bit of magic and a little bit of, you know, um, flair, a little bit of that, uh, then, you know, have a pour over station or something next to the espresso machine. Um, I, I really don't believe customers care that much about what a barista is doing behind a machine, except for, um, as the boys mentioned, latte art. That's probably the most iconic, identifiable thing for a customer. With the attrition rate um, already pretty high in the industry, um, do you think that by separating the two roles, um, there will be, uh, I guess, less scope for people's career and progression, I guess, in the industry? Uh, sorry, the impression of? The progression of their career. Oh, the progression? Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess at the moment, m most baristas will, when I'm hiring a barista, they'll come to me and I'll be like, what do you want? Like, tell me what you want. I know you're applying for a barista role, but we're a reasonably sized company and we can offer you some other things. What do you want? And they'll say, at the moment, 90% of the time, they'll say, I want to learn. And I'll be like, great, that's fantastic. Remember, you're serving coffee to customers. That's, you know, a lot of your role. But we can offer you X, Y, and Z to help you learn um, and help you progress. Uh, I think most of the progressions that currently exist uh, will be the same, but I think that in the act of segregation and specialization, if you are focused on just learning about coffee, then the programs that you'll provide your front of house staff, your service baristas, for education just about coffee will probably satisfy them because they'll be pretty thorough and they'll have a lot, a lot of information about them. When a barista comes to me and says, I want to learn about coffee, I'm not sure whether they want to learn about you know, the technicalities of brewing espresso and refractometers and all that kind of stuff, or do they want to learn about farms and where the coffee comes from and processing, or do they want to learn about logistics and, you know, all that side of the coffee business? I think it actually opens up more avenues for progression in terms of knowledge, and in terms of career, you've created another, you, you know, you've sort of doubled the number of um, linear sort of paths that someone can go on as they move through that role. So that as you move through, you might become the educator for the baristas, and if you're a technical barista, you might become the person who devises more of the recipes, and you know, there's another hierarchy that you can move up that's more specialized to what you're after. So um, personally, if I was offered the role you know, five years ago um, at St. Ali of becoming the technical barista and learning about all that stuff, I would be stoked. And I know a few baristas that wouldn't care less about all that kind of stuff, and they're gonna have a really great time progressing becoming closer with customers and becoming a better service professional. So, I, I don't know, maybe if someone wants a different kind of progression than being better at the job that they've you know, applied for or becoming a manager of that, then they obviously need to go and run their own business because there's only so much that we can offer um, staff members. Um, you've been talking about fully automatic machines and knowing it Knowing them very well uh, from my day job, I can tell that they are not complying to the expectations of the professional barista. Mm -hmm. So in terms of system integration, and there is a built-in grinder, and they save a lot of money on those grinders and all that sort of stuff. Um, what do you think is realistic for your theory that super automatic manufacturers pick on your theory? Mm -hmm. and deliver your, the machines that you need for mm -hmm. that concept? Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about it, you could write a list. So say you had a robot uh, that could move and do anything that you wanted. That robot has to take a handle out of a machine, put that handle underneath a spout, press a button and get coffee out of the grinder, push a piston into the basket, insert basket into machine, make sure the machine delivers X amount of fluid, in why not amount of time. That's a robot. That's a machine. The, what baristas are doing is super automatic. We're just hiring humans to be super automatic. So I think the problem is that machine manufacturers um, and the people who would be needing to buy the level of sophistication of machine aren't connected. Machines can be made that deliver that amount of control but the customers aren't there and the manufacturers aren't willing to build a machine for that price, perhaps, yet. 
Uh, I'm sure it will, the price will come down. It'll probably be very similar eventually. But I think there's just a disconnect between the quality and um, what needs to be done, because it is robotics. Yeah, as you know. <laughs> to take your analogy of the electric car and the hybrid yep. one step further, mm -hmm. does the hybrid exist today? And if not, what, what features does it have? Well, I guess we've been trying to hack together a hybrid. Uh, I guess the, the combustion example is like a pressure profiling strata machine with a, you know, a manual grinder or someone who doses coffee manually. That's, that's the extreme example that way. And because I'm a systems guy and I like knuckling things down, we started using volumetrics and we started weighing all of our porta filters and we started uh, doing all of the things that a machine would do if it were making coffee on our bar. So I guess we are the hybrid right now and there isn't really a step between what we're doing right now and a machine that just does that movement of the coffee stuff for us. I think we're currently at hybrid status, applying machine, you know, sort of robotic principles to what has been an artistic human sort of uh, flow of movement. So I think we're pretty much there. There will be other baby steps. Maybe there'll be a machine that, uh, maybe there'll be a machine that grinds and tamps for us uh, the correct amount of coffee, and then we just take the handle out and put it in the machine. I mean, it's been made and it's already accepted, so that's another step forward. There's not many steps to go. Yeah, uh, so does Lamont Soccer. I was making a, um, I was, yeah, <laughs> throwing a little uh, <laughs> at them just then. There's just one in the back there. Um, just, just a quick one. Uh, if this is the future of specialty coffee, the death of barista, all of that, um, for yourself as a competing barista, someone that's kind of made their name through competition, mm -hmm. how would you see this would ever affect competition? Because obviously that would come ex extinct which I yeah. feel is a huge part of Massive. the industry that we're Massive in. part. All the baristas that are on stage at the moment, they're just following recipes and everyone out the back is using scales and doing practically what an automatic machine would do. So really, the barista competitions, if we're celebrating the barista inserting a handle into a machine and saying that that's what the essence of a barista competition is, then it's just masturbation. Whereas if we're going to be celebrating service and knowledge, then that's what this kind of machine would allow a barista to vote their 15 minutes that they have on stage. They can spend one minute, they've already dialed in their coffee, they can spend one minute making the coffee and 14 minutes making those judges' lives. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it, we're all just doing the same thing on stage anyway. It, it, there's nothing to celebrate in a barista competition about dosing and tamping. It's just boring, repetitive, nothing. And if I was a consumer watching a barista competition, I'd be much more interested in hearing a story for 14 minutes than watching someone um, and analyzing their dosing technique or how many seconds they spend using a grinder. It's boredom. Yeah, but then surely you're actually giving a consumer the understanding of what happens in a cafe on an everyday basis where they don't see you pick up a port filter, don't know what a port filter is from what you said earlier. No. Surely that's educating them. It is educating them, but if, if, a, if a consumer is watching a barista competition, um, they're obviously interested in coffee and Watching baristas dose and tamp coffee all day long is, you know, okay, maybe if that's your thing that you want to watch, but I want to listen to baristas and hear their stories and learn about the coffees and why they're brewing them the way that they're brewing them, rather than just watching repetitive motion over and over again. And if that barista can then execute that recipe and execute that vision um, with precision using equipment, rock and roll, they, the judges will be happy and they'll be able to actually showcase um, their decisions and all of the effort that they've put in thus far um, really, really well. But I do get you, there's always going to be people that want to watch what baristas do. Um, there's just not that many of them. And like, so maybe MasterChef is a good example. People watch MasterChef because they want to watch what chefs do, but chefs aren't doing three things all the time. They're not packing coffee into a filter and then tamping it and then we watch some ad breaks and then we come back and watch some people dosing some coffee into a basket and tamping it. Um, Master Chef, you know, like people watch that because it's visual and there's lots of things going on, different techniques, different, uh, different ways of using a frying pan, different appliances, different ingredients, they're all colorful and wonderful to watch. 
but coffee is brown liquid in a cup. But then it, if you're going to say that, there's different competitions. Yourself, you've done three different competitions mm. which showcase three different things yep. in the aspect. So well, surely that's going further down the line of being a chef. You're showcasing different ways of yeah, producing coffee. Yeah, but I guess, I guess the different competitions, it'd be the same as having a, a pastry competition and uh, like a pastry chef competition and a line chef um, competition. It's just different, different end products. And yeah, of, of course there will be people that want to see it, but maybe the competitions will stay completely manual and maybe they'll um, completely rebel against um, super automatics. And that's great because then there'll still be, you know, another differentiation between competitors. But um, most of what I foresee happening is service related uh, in the real world rather than just competition. So I've got one thought for you, Matt, right here. Um, so in kind of what I'm hearing right now is in some ways you're describing Starbucks with good coffee. Um, <laughs> And I guess my question back to you would be, uh, thinking back on the movement, and to me, the moment that third wave, what we call third wave or specialty coffee, really took hold is around the moment that Starbucks switched to super automatics, which left an opening in the market to tell another story about hand craftsmanship mm -hmm. and the art of the barista. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would challenge you, you know, what, what do you think was that opening in the market when that changed? Was it just better coffee? Yep. Or was there the story itself that was enticing? What, the, what that rebellion was against was bad coffee. We were rebelling against super automatics that make crap coffee. Um, or maybe it was just crap coffee made in good machines. But the rebellion was against bad coffee. But if you can automatically make good coffee, what's the rebellion? <laughs> there is none. Yes. And good is, of course, subjective. It's always subjective. And come to the story. Yeah. But if nothing else, I want you all to think about this. I'm not saying it will happen. I'm just saying it very, very well could. Do we have any more questions? Good questions, though. Hi, Matt. Thank you for you know, bringing this subject uh, to everybody. I don't know if I'll be able to <coughs> sorry, articulate that very well, but I'll try. So first, for the competition, I think for the general public, to, um, I think they find it boring first because they can't taste the coffee anyway. I find it boring watching it sometimes because I can't be the judge and tasting the coffee. So you're missing the point mm -hmm. in a way uh, for the general public. Um, so that's one, one thing. And so, and that takes us to uh, what we are here for. It's for the coffee. That's not just the experience, the visual experience or the coffee shop experience. It's what it is all about. It's the, um, the imagination of coffee. It's the, uh, the dream, the, uh, mm -hmm. um, the passion. And really, if I, if I think of myself as a general customer, I don't find it very emotional to have a coffee served by a machine mm -hmm. just by pressing a button. And mm -hmm. I think that point makes a difference. Yep. If I think of myself before I was into coffee, I would not go to Starbucks. <clears throat> I, I didn't know anything about coffee, but I didn't, I never been to, to Starbucks. Mm -hmm. I went to artisan coffee, or, you know, like crafts coffee because yep. that was the, uh, the emotion and I think the emotion comes from the human aspect and the, the craft. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what your thoughts are. I don't know if it was very really clear. But. All right. Um, yeah. We'll turn that into a question. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Obviously, there's always an emotional aspect and for me, like quality is ultimate. Um, service is ultimate. Um, how we get there is secondary. So that's, that's my opinion anyway. I just have one, one final kind of question, thought. Uh, wait, oh, Google? All right, we'll go there in a second. Because um, <clears throat> we've kind of seen this already happen in the States, and I think it's happening globally with uh, the home market. Like, the K-cups and capsules have completely swept the world. And now I have conversations with aunts and uncles all the time that are coffee fanatics uh, because they love their, their K-cup machine that they've got. Uh, 
But I don't, it's hard to take them very seriously as coffee fanatics. Yeah. Do well, you... I guess what, what they're in love with isn't the K-cup machine. What they're in love with is being able to get coffee that doesn't totally suck really, really conveniently. They don't know how the K-cup machine works. They don't know, you know, all that kind of stuff in there. What they love is coffee. And they love now that they can get coffee really, really easily. It's not necessarily the machine, I don't think. Fair enough. Google? So, question, you and I, 20 years in the future. All right. Intelli Stump Bottle, massive growth, doing great. Right. They have their fully automatic machine. It's crushing it. Killing it. Around them, though, so you have competitors following their model, have gone through and successfully cloned what they do, lowering the standards year by year by a little bit. Do you see a time Why? of the death of the death of the death of the barista <laughs> where I can begin to define my speciality company by the flair of the manual machine? I'm sure that there will be, you know, there will always be the race to the bottom, and then eventually that shop will turn into a vending machine. Um, or maybe you could beat them and do vending machines now. Well, um, I'm thinking about doing vending machines now and then beating myself <laughs> and doing a manual machine to beat my vending machine. Right. Uh, of course, it'll, there'll be ebbs and flows, I think. Uh, so I can't, I can't really predict that or prospect that. But obviously, there'll be some companies that will treat it as a race to the bottom as soon as they have access to really, really good coffee uh, automatically um, via machine. They'll turn that into a box that you wave your Apple Watch at and it gives you really good coffee. And there are customers that will want that product, but they're not going to pay specialty prices for it because that becomes normal. That's not specialty. Even if it's good quality coffee, it's not specialty. So then we still have the venues and we still have the service that will demand higher prices. So there will always, like, I think we'll be always trending better, but the prices will always stay the same. Yeah, relatively, maybe coffee will go up because of you know, demand and supply and things like that. Say it's the same, there will always be better, average, and worse. And average is going to be better than it is now, and better is going to be much better. So it will still demand higher prices. And then there'll be the companies that squeeze every penny and you know, drop it down and get rid of the service. So, I don't know. You differentiate with your service, uh, so you, you know, your training of your staff the quality of your roasting and your recipes, or the style of your coffee. So now that you can actually accurately depict, like the way that a winemaker puts wine in a bottle and delivers it to you, and you can taste his vision and skill in a glass, that's a great differentiator. And look how many different kinds of wine there are and how well they're represented. As coffee, we aren't at that level yet. So then we'll be able to have producers that are very, very differentiated. We'll be able to have consumers that can taste the difference between uh, Katura and you know, diff, diff, Catamore and all kinds of varieties because it'll be so much better and so much more transparent and accurately made. Um, that will be our differentiation, I think. Your, your wine reference is the segue that we all need to say, we need to wrap it up. <laughs> and everyone should go grab a glass of wine or get out of here because we have to transition the room. But let's give a big round of applause to Matt for his talk you, Thank you, Matt.